Well, welcome everybody. Tad Hargrave here from marketingforhippies.com. And I'm joined by my colleague, Danny Berman from uh, in London, England. Today, we're going to be talking about joint ventures. And so I've known Danny uh, for a few years now. Uh, he was working with uh, another Danny, Danny Inney, uh, on some promotions. And the thing that I noticed about working with Danny is he, he just made it, uh, this Danny, Danny Berman, is he made it very easy well, both of them really, uh, to do the promotion that the number of times I've been asked to be an affiliate for something and it's felt, I don't know, cumbersome, difficult, burdensome on my side, confusing. And he made it really easy and has been very generous, also sent a number of people my way over the years uh, and connected me with other colleagues. And uh, Danny Berman is now putting out a, a program of his own teaching people how to do joint ventures and particularly since the hub marketing semester is coming up in the membership feels like a good thing to be thinking about um so let's just dive into it so first of all i guess we should start with what is uh well dan i don't know if there's anything else you want to say by way of introducing yourself but uh if not my first question is just what is a a joint venture so a joint venture is basically when two uh, two parties, basically two individuals or two businesses, uh, or more two or many, it could be many businesses, decide to join forces for the purpose of of a goal and objective that you both have. So it may be, for example, that one business uh, is an expert on marketing strategy, and another business is an expert on email marketing, and you just, and and you both decide we both have really complementary uh, offers. Uh, why don't we actually run a joint webinar together? Uh, I'll talk about marketing strategy. You know, you talk about what do you do to actually get those people on your email list and convert them. Uh, and, you know, we both benefit uh, and we'll, we'll both promote it to our audiences. So we both, you know, we both get email subscribers. We both get interest. Uh, and and um, it, it, it basically you get uh, a multiplier effect, essentially. You have a, a much, much stronger results for a lot less effort because you're joining forces with, with, with other people. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is, I mean, I've come to know this in, in my lingo as, as hub marketing, though I think joint venture is a kind of a more particular subset of that. And I think it was from Jay Abraham who I first heard these notions of, um, I think he called them like host beneficiary relationships and that, yeah, there's often this strength that can come uh, from working together. You know, I think also about a, you got all the bookshops that have coffee shops in them now, and they mm -hmm. realize, hey, we've got very complementary audiences. We should work together, and yeah. that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. there was a company called Moon Dance Paints. They were one, one of the first uh, non toxic paint companies, and it was back 30, 40 years ago. And they were trying to think, how do we reach our people? Mm -hmm. And uh, because particularly because it was a brand new thing and people didn't even know about it as a category, as an option. So yeah. they went to the local Whole Foods and said, would you be willing to host a Green Your Home series? Yeah. And, and of course that worked out for Whole Foods because it would bring people in. And then they went to like a green architect, green landscape, a green interior designer. And they did a series of workshops, but they all did it together. And by working together in this joint venture, everybody benefited. Yeah. You know, the landscaper got business from the interior designer who got business from the architect who got business from the paint company. Uh, everyone got introduced to each other's businesses. And it was such an eye-opener for me, this notion of you can actually build your business by building relationships and building community. Uh, now, so <clears throat> I think what people are seeing a lot now online as well you've just got to be on social media, you got to post, you got to, you know, that's the way to do it. What is, I'm curious what other ways you see people marketing themselves or going about reaching people uh, other than joint ventures? And, and how do you feel like, where does joint venturing fit in that? Or how does it compare to some of these other tactics? Like, why are you focused so particularly on, on this? So I, I, I don't necessarily advocate against advertising. I don't advocate against social media activity. But what I do say to, uh, to, to entrepreneurs is that why aren't you focusing always on low-hanging fruit before anything else? 
why do we always look for the most complicated, convoluted way to get clients, right? When the opportunities are standing right in front of you, there are people in your network who know you, trust you, have worked with you, you know, for example, your own clients, you may have audiences, right? Why aren't you starting with those people? They are, without a doubt, your easiest route to, to, to the market you're looking to target. So what I am saying to, to people is start with joint ventures uh, and there's nothing to stop you from looking at other other avenues as well, particularly with a lot of businesses who they're solopreneurs, they're bootstrapping, they don't have the, the, the finance or the means to advertise uh, and they don't necessarily have the... Um, they don't necessarily also have a, a situation, the luxury of being able to spend many, many months running a social media campaign that might eventually yield leads. Uh, the, the turnaround with a joint venture is, 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 is a lot quicker. The people are a lot warmer because they know you and, and, and uh, they've been recommended to you. So, so start with that uh, before you look at anything else. That, that's really my message. Yeah, it's funny. So I do close-up magic, you know, yeah. uh, uh, tricks and... Uh, the, like one of the things I noticed is every magician has this experience and the audience has this experience too, where you want so desperately to know how the trick is done. Yeah. Cause it's so baffling. And when you learn how it's done, it's universally disappointing. Yeah. And of course, now there's all sorts of YouTube videos of people exposing tricks and it seems amazing. Yeah. And then they turn the camera angle and you see how it's done and you feel let down. And, uh, I feel like this with with the uh, marketing where people might see the results. It's like, wow, how did you grow your business like that? It's like a magic trick. How did you get so many people? How did you grow your email list? How did you get so many people signed up for your course? How did you sell so much of that product? They want to know so desperately, you know, and then they say, oh, I did this really simple thing. I did these partnerships. I did some joint ventures. And it's it's kind of like the trick being revealed. And And some part of us, like you said, I don't know why, because I've seen this, uh, mm. I've been commenting it over the last year. I, I say, I'm going to tell you something and it's going to seem too simple and you're going to feel disappointed, but this is the real stuff. And, I, and there's some part of us that just wants it to be harder. That's like, well, because it's so simple in the mechanism, it somehow can't be that profound in the application. It can't get the results, even though you might have just seen the trick. It's like, no, no, remember, you were amazed by this 10 seconds ago. Right. And and yet people, you know, there's the, there's this one where the, you know, the I take the pen. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, draw a little X here. Yeah. In my hand and I just go, watch, watch the X. The X can't come off. But if I just do this, watch. One, two, three. And the pen's gone. It seems really impressive until I... <laughs> But again, the, the effect initially is like, where the hell did the pen go? Yeah. But once we see the revelation, we're not impressed. And so, I mean, I, I would underscore what you've just said about, um, you know, why do we need to make it so complicated? There's such low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's an assumption that marketing is complicated and maybe there's also, uh, I think maybe some marketing expert bears some guilt for that. There is a, uh, there's a well-known saying, and I think it might be attributed to Jay Abraham, which is like he or she who spends the most on advertising gets the best results. It's, 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 it's something like that. And then there is this assumption that the more money you have, essentially the fewer barriers to entry you have. You have the ability to basically reach a lot more people. Uh, you can test a lot more advertising messages, and therefore you can cut through and get 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 a lot more eyeballs and uh, and, and I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think the, the, the joint ventures actually is, the, I call it the great leveler. You know, you're suddenly, whereas previously there was this assumption that, you know, if I want to break into a market, I have to advertise a lot. I've got to have a large marketing budget. With, with, um, with joint ventures, it's actually about being smarter. You know, it's about, it, it's not about, it's not about the money, but it's about cultivating strategic partnerships to people who have access to your audience. It doesn't cost you any money. But it does basically, it involves you having to be smart. It involves you having to think carefully, who in my network is 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 aligned with what I do? Who in my network is speaking to the same audiences as me? Um, who in my network do I have a good relationship with that we can, we can join forces with? Um, and you can actually very quickly grow your audience uh, and grow your business, but without a large you know, marketing investment. 
Yeah. I'd love to ask you in a minute to share some stories or case studies or examples you've seen or participated in of, of that. But first, what do you see as the biggest mistakes that people make when they're approaching the whole joint venture thing? Let's say somebody sold, they say, yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, I'm going to go do that. How do people screw this up? I think what people have difficulty in getting their head around is that joint ventures involve you often having to give first. There is a concept in joint ventures called giving value in advance, which means if you want somebody to reciprocate with you, um, you have to start off by saying, what can I do to help you? I really like your program. I like your, 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 um, I like the, 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 the journey you take your audience well through. Can I host your my podcast? You know, can I write an article about you? Can I interview you? Um, do you have something coming up that I can tell my audience about? That, that is your starting point. If you go into a potential relationship with this mindset of what can you do for me, um, it's going to be it's going to be a lot harder. Uh, and uh, it, it, the reason that is it, it, the, the reason that, that it's like that is the whole purpose of a joint venture is the starting point has got to be not just what will you do for me, but do you have something that my audience will benefit from? Right. So, you know, I, it's not just about what it's, it's, it's thinking, OK, this is what I teach my audience. Um, but you are offering something that are going to take my orders to the next level that I don't offer. So I'm going to start off by actually looking at what I can do to help you. And it's human nature that when you, you know, don't be cynical. There's got to be a line of both directions, right? But, but um, what, what, what happens is that when you go in with that mindset, people then naturally want to support you as well. Um, but the relationship is, 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 is uh, spoiled by the fact that one of you is transactional, one of you is going in and, and saying, okay, what can I get out of this? And, and then uh, it doesn't work. But so yeah. so, so it, the prerequisite is you do have to have a mutual appreciation of what you both have to offer. You have to have an audience that is aligned and you need to have a uh, feel this, this is something that I can work with because it's got to work yeah. for both of you. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting. What about in situations where, you know, I've certainly seen it where, okay, it works for me to promote you, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make sense for you to promote me. Like you can help my people, but I can't help your people much. You know, it's it's not a two directional fit. Right. Uh, what do you suggest in those kinds of situations? So, so, so sometimes that can still work. Um, I, I've had people who will say, well, you know, you're offering something. My, in some ways, it's the best compliment. You're, you're sometimes have people who approach you, who say you are doing something my audience really need. How can I, you know, how can I tell my audience about you? And actually, in some cases, it's a win-win because you're actually, when that person promotes you, you're already helping them. So it's, some sometimes that can work very well. Um, how do they, how do you mean when, when they promote you, you're helping them? because you mean you're you're bringing something their audience needs correct correct so it may be that i'm i'm running a program where i'm basically teaching my audience how to grow their business what i'm not teaching them with what i'm not teaching them about is about um things like uh dealing with limiting beliefs so that they might right they may you may be you may be able to help them with growing their business but they might be self-sabotaging what they're doing so you're realizing that is Kind of harming your success rate with your with your students so what you might do is say listen i really like the fact that you're helping people who get stuck you know you get people for example who they they, they start creating a course and they don't finish it right mm -hmm. um, so i want to get i want to improve the completion rate of my program so i want to join forces with you um because you run a program that helps people who don't complete things right so so that that's helping you but it's also obviously helping me because i'm going to have a high success rate on my program with those through that collaboration. Yeah, it's something that I have to remind people of is that there's a number of, I mean, George Cow talks about this idea of three wins in these joint ventures. It's gotta be a win for you, it's gotta be a win for them, but also has to be a win for their people. That's the, the triangle of it. Yeah. And people forget that, one, if you offer something that really is a win for their people, sort of inherently there's a win in it Yeah. Uh, for, for the host, because if their people are coming back to them saying, thank you so much for bringing that person in, thank you for introducing me, it's been amazing, that makes the host look good, it increases their social capital, uh, and that's a win. Um, 
I would say the other place I see people screwed up is they make things desperately hard for the person promoting them. You know, they don't give the materials, they don't give a very clear, here's how to promote this thing, here's the swipe copy, here's the, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lack of signposting. There's this assumption that once you've agreed to work together, it's done, there's nothing else to do. Uh, but the re reality is that most people who engage in partnerships are solopreneurs. They are often flying by the seat of their pants. They're not necessarily organized. And you have to make it as easy as possible for somebody to promote you. Um, and so, and what that means is that if you agree to work together with somebody, it means you have to check in with each other regularly to, to say, well, I just mm -hmm. want to check all the dates we agreed to work together. Do they still work? Um, I've got some, uh, I've got some assets I've created you to help promote me. Uh, I'm going to make sure I send those to you well in advance of when you're promoting me. Uh, I'm going to check in with you afterwards to make sure you got those assets. Uh, I'm going to check in with you to make sure, do you have somebody else on your team that I should be talking to and so on. Yeah. Uh, and I think what people neglect is the fact that you have to almost over communicate with somebody to have a good relationship. Uh, there is a, there isn't this assumption that you have when you're contacting somebody regularly, you know, I must be driving him crazy. I've sent him an email two weeks ago and I'm emailing him again now. And the reality is you're probably only just cutting through to somebody. You're just getting through to them. Right. And, 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 and you're dealing with the fact that your partners are getting over a hundred emails each day. There are lots of calls. There are lots of Slack messages and WhatsApp messages. So you have to work really, really hard to communicate with partners. And that's where I see things going wrong where, where, uh, someone says, well, this person said they'd promote me, but they, and then they dropped the ball. The reality is they dropped the ball probably because you weren't communicating clearly with them. So so they forgot, didn't realize that what was happening was happening. It's the best advice I can give anyone on joint ventures is approach and engage with your joint venture partners as if they're on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. Like as if they're so maxed out they never see the bottom of their email inbox. And that's probably true, especially if you're going to be sort of partnering up, you know, with somebody who's got a maybe bigger following than you, or they're so busy, they're overwhelmed. They probably don't have their life completely in balance. And the, you know, I know for myself, I, the reminders are helpful because I will agree to things and then forget I agreed. Um, and we're just actually going through this internally of, We've got all these people in the membership who aren't paying and we're like, wait, which of these people are not paying because there was a glitch and which of them did I say you can stay forever as a free member? Like, yeah. And I just got an email this morning and somebody said, oh, I found the email. Here's where you said I could be here as a permanent guest. And yeah. I was like, okay, great, thank you. But I'd forgotten. And so uh, it's very easy for our partners to lose track because for us, of course, the thing we're promoting is the most important thing in our world. For them, it's it's one little twig on a, a massive tree of all of their endeavors. Correct, correct, correct. And, and as you said, um, people often only check the top of their email, uh, you know, the top of their inbox, the bottom of their inbox gets forgotten about. Um, a, a high proportion of email goes into spam. Uh, and then you get, and we all do it, you, you inadvertently delete something you think is an automated message, but was actually something personal. <laughs> we've, all, we've all done that. Uh, and it's why I sometimes, when people don't reply to me by email, rather than assuming they're not re replying, I'm assuming they've not seen my message. So I will then go to Facebook and think, well, maybe, uh, you know, it might be easy to get hold of them there, or I might even go to LinkedIn and try messaging them there. And and, and um, yeah, I'll be, you'd be surprised by the number of people who say, no, no, I never got your message. But but you know, glad you messaged me on Facebook. Oh, yeah, exactly. I've had colleagues reach out on WhatsApp, just, hey, wanted to make sure you got that, hadn't heard back from you. Sometimes they'll get it on three different platforms. And it's, I, it really, for me, it's not landing as pushy, it's landing as, I just feel guilty. It's, ah, oh, shit. I said, <laughs> them and I did. And I'm yeah. grateful for them <clears throat> following up because I do want to keep my word. I do want to do the things I said I was yeah. going to do. Yeah. Um, now, Generally, what are the steps that people need to go through or to think through with the um, with joint venturing? If if you had to lay it out in a series of steps, yeah. So, so I think I think the first I think the first step to do is it, you actually need to think a bit about your own offer, mm. and what you need to think about is 
you need to give some thought to really what is the what is the what is the the the, the problem I'm really trying to help my audience solve? You know, wh where are they where are they suffering right now? If I can use that language, and where is where is this destination I'm trying to take them to? Where are they, Where will they be three months, six months, nine months off down the line after I work with them? Uh, you know, what are their you know, what are these people struggling with in life? What are their values, right? What matters to them? Because these are these are things that are really going to matter when you partner with somebody else. Because you have to those those pain points and those um, aspirations and, and the, those values they really matter when you think about who, you, who who's going to be a good partner, who isn't. Uh, so so that's the first thing. Um, and once you're clear about who you're serving and where you're taking them to, it's then thinking about. The partners you're trying to reach so they may be people who are in your existing network they may be part of a, 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 a it might be a part of some professional group you're part of it might be some of your linkedin network um it might be people who you follow i mean i've reached out to people on the people whose email list i'm on and i read their emails and i've reached out to them to, to partner yeah. with them but but the, the step is if you see somebody who you feel is aligned with you who could be a good partner um reaching out to to to, to meet up with them and I think the key thing is to be to do proper due diligence. A lot of people rush into partnerships because, again, they're thinking transactionally, what can I get out of this? I, I want to I want to partner with as many people as possible. Um, I the the, the what, one, one, of, one of the really important things about partnerships is you don't need to partner with a lot of people. You need to partner mm -hmm. with the right people. Um, you, you know, we all know about the 80 20 rule that 20 percent of, you know, 20 percent of your customers make up 80 percent of your sales. It's the same thing with partnerships. About 20% of your partners will bring in about 80% of your business. So be very thorough when you are thinking about who to partner with. Take the time to actually, I will spend as long as 45 minutes on a call with somebody because I want to really understand like who is your audience, right? Who are these people? What do they believe in? What, what's, what, what, what do they want to achieve in their life? What are they struggling with them? Where, where do you take them to? So that's, that's the first thing. I need to understand are our audiences aligned? Um, the next thing I need to understand is, is, um, is there a product fit? Um, so it may be, there's, there's different ways that you can complement each other. So it may be that um, your, your, what you do is upstream for me, which means that I'm taking my audience to a certain point, but then I would really benefit from partnering with somebody who can take them to the next level. So that's, you know, that's, that's a upstream. Um, there could be somebody, somebody who, your, for example, it may be that I'm working with uh, people to help them get their business to six figures and beyond. Um, and I partner with somebody who's working with newbies who are just trying to build a viable business that does five figures, right? So so they, they'll be a downstream there. They're helping get their audience to five figures. And maybe I don't know, taking on them from there because it's different challenges when you're getting going from five figures to six figures and, and, then, and then you grow. So, so there's that. And then there's also uh, partners where it's about just complementary things. So it may be my focus is on I teach marketing strategy. I don't teach Instagram. So I'm I'm basically working with people who teach tactics, right? I, I teach strategy. I don't teach tactics. So I want people who teach tactics to complement me. So that so so you've got to have you've got to think about um, is it a good uh, is it a good pro is it a good uh, is there a good audience fit is there a good product fit and of course what I the other thing about that is, are you at the same level? So if, if somebody is selling a program where it's a few hundred dollars, it's not going to work well to partner with someone who's selling a program for $10,000. You're not, yeah. you're not, you're not, you're not in the right, you're not in the same place. So is there an audience fit? Is there a product fit? But the third thing is, can we work together? And that is often overlooked. You know, is this someone who you actually feel comfortable working with? Um, I've met people where I like their offer. I like their audience, but I feel they're too transactional and I feel extremely uncomfortable working with them. And it's it's not going to work if you can't have a good working relationship with them. So, uh, and, and, and I'd say in many ways, that's the most important because if you're building a long-term relationship, uh, you have to feel comfortable uh, with the way your partner works um, and with the way they, um, it's not even, it, there's two sides to it actually. It's, it, it's that you need to feel, feel comfortable person with them that also on a practical basis, they need to be a partner you can work with. I've, I've, I've tried partnering with people, for example, who are so chronically disorganized, we can't get anything done yeah. because, because they're, they're never, we have a meeting, they drop the ball, they never turn up. 
uh, we agreed to do something and they never replied to me and so on. So, so, so basically it's down to, you need to be methodical in terms of your audience. There needs to be a product fit and you need to feel comfortable working together as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, boy, the, um, yeah, I have colleagues who even just through the grapevine, I know how overwhelmed and disorganized they are. And if they ever wanted to work with me, I, 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 the answer is either no, or there'd be a very frank conversation like, look, this is the word on the street. Yeah. You know, you, you uh, overpromise a lot. And I don't think I can work with you in that case. The other thing is people will have different marketing styles, you know, uh, different approaches. And if those aren't aligned, this can, uh, you know, just not work out. I mean, there was a colleague who, I like his work a lot, but something about the marketing, I got a few complaints from my people and I did a survey. I said, I want your candid feedback. And I had a four question survey of the four questions were, um, how accurate was the marketing? Did you get what was promised? Of what you got, how good was it? One through 10. Um, how did the marketing feel overall? One through 10. And should I endorse them again? One through 10. And the overall score was 50%. And I reached out to them. I was like, I like you. I think you're really good at what you do. I'll probably still be able to endorse your programs, but I can't endorse your marketing. Yeah. Strangely, you know, yeah. so I had to figure out a way of, even though I like the person a lot, I think they're really genius at what they do. But it, for my people, it just didn't feel good. It, it wasn't a fit, and w which was going to hurt my already was hurting my reputation. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. I, I, if I quote, if I can quote Danny Any, Danny Any once said that I want your audience to like you even more after you've promoted me than they do before you promote me. That's a great criteria. Yeah, exactly, because that's a win. It's like, oh, wow, thank you so much. That's what I want. I promote somebody and I want people reaching out saying, that was the best. That was so helpful. Oh my God, everybody you recommend is amazing. This person was the best. That's what I want. Yeah. Um, I, um, I lo love what you're saying about this, the offer partners, due diligence, but that it starts with the offer. It starts with some clarity about what you're putting out. That if you reach out to a partner and you say, I've got this product and the best part is it can help everybody with everything yeah it's almost impossible for them to then even think about how to position it to their their folks. yeah yeah in fact one thing i missed when, when, I, when i spoke about due diligence one thing i recommend doing is if this person has offered this product in the past i would say check out their ask them can they send you a replay from their last launch can they send you the landing pages and stuff because i have just like you said i have seen i've worked with partners who offered to promote somebody and regretted it afterwards because they found that the material that they were promoting was just inappropriate for their audience. Um, so you, you've got to be able to, and, and in fact, it's even acceptable to say to somebody, if they don't have the materials ready yet, to say to them, listen, in principle, I'd love to promote you, but I really, really need to see what I'm promoting before giving the green light. That is, man, yeah. everybody who's watching this, you just, that's, gold advice because yeah you might like them as a person you might like their vibe you might like their instagram but if you're going to promote it it's good to see the content i mean the uh because other if you don't check it out at some level there's just there's such a chance your people could reach out and say why this is ridiculous what are you doing promoting this you can watch right. it double speed i mean you can sit there and just watch it double right. speed just to right. get a sense of is this good content also is there language that would yeah be offensive to your people and one colleague he had a, he was teaching people how to do webinars and he had a piece of like and here's the part in the webinar where you pick the three beliefs you're going to install in the audience and i was like i can't use that language with my people yeah that would be the end of the, they would just stop and leave at that point. So, and I talked to them about it and he just said, well, that's just the language I use. And I said, okay, it's just not a fit for my yeah. people. And I wouldn't say that's, you know, a language we can use too. Just to, to, it's not a judgment of these people. It's just, oh, this isn't going to work out for my audience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and 
It, 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 there's, there's, the, there's the content, there's, there's the language, but it's also just looking at the, the, the actual aesthetics of the page. Does the, you know, does the tone, does the feel, it, it, is it the kind of vibe my audience are going to connect with? Um, you know, I, I've heard the phrase used, actually, some of my clients have, they've looked at partners and they've said to me, no, 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 this is too bro. You know, this is, this is bro marketing. I can't yeah. match this up. Yeah, I've, I've, and I've had it with it, like Americans have a kind of, there's a kind of glitz and glam in the marketing sometimes. And I look at it and I think, I, I love what you're up to, but this is just so anti-hippie yeah. that if I promote it, I will have to make a point of saying, I know. Actually, I did this with some colleagues because their videos were so slick but so slick, it was a little disconcerting. And I had to tell my people, like, look, their style is different. I'm yeah. more just talk to the camera, going for a walk. Yeah. And they're different, and it, but their content's good. And I had to remind them. So um, maybe before any stories, you've got your course coming up. And yeah. uh, so this is the shameless plug portion. Uh, if you'd like to talk about what you have coming up, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh... There, there too, firstly, there's the webinar coming up on the 29th of August that, uh, uh, that's taking place at three o'clock Eastern. And that's called Six JV Partners to Six Figures. Uh, and the, 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 the reason it's called Six JV Partners to Six Figures is uh, what I said a bit earlier in our discussion, that you don't need to have a lot of JV partners. You need to have the right partners. Um, and when you're intentional about who you want to work with and how you want to work with them, you, you, you're you going to get much better results. So. What, 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 what we're going to be doing during the webinar is taking you through the three-step process that I use um, to get to get the right partners on, on board. Um, and then what we'll be um, what we'll be offering at the end of the webinar is uh, that uh, we for those of you who are looking to do JV partners, joint JV partnership, but you're not sure if you're ready uh, to do JV partnerships, um, we're going to be hosting a boot camp between the 9th and 13th of September. And that's going to, that's called get, get Joint Venture Ready within just five days. Uh, and the reason um, we came up with this is that uh, I've been approached by hundreds of coaches and consultants um, who said, yes, I'd love to do joint ventures, uh, but they don't have clarity on who to partner with. Um, they don't have an audience. Um, they don't have a very clearly defined offer. Uh, and so there's some things, there's some really vital uh uh, things that you need to have in place for partnerships and what we're going to be doing over the, the, those five days is, is to help you get those in place so that you can go with confidence to start building partnerships that is fantastic i loved it i remember the first time i heard you say six joint venture partners I'm like that's all you need and it made so much sense because uh, i think that's probably another way people can go wrong is they think oh i need a hundred joint venture partners but then just the sheer logistics the number of emails uh you're not going to be able to communicate with them all well uh, or it will consume you that will be your whole life it'll eat you alive i have i have had a number of situations of jv partners who have said to me i'm sorry i'm going to have to let you down i've overcommitted myself that is one of a major consequence that 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 you shoot you you basically sabotage your efforts because you cannot when you're working with too many people you cannot give people the attention uh, and the efforts that 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 they deserve. Um, whereas if you're working with with uh, a small number of dedicated partners, you're obviously going to get much better results together. It makes so much sense to me. Just intuitively, the people spread themselves too thin, and then it's it's um they get almost nothing, you know, from it, rather than you, know, you focus on the six, you build really good long-term relationships with those six, you figure out the right rhythm of, of uh, promotion. And man, those partnerships can last for years and years and years, and you just keep bringing each other business um, or one direction or that either yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you will, in reality, you'll be meeting more than six partners. But what I'm trying to say is that you will, you'll want to kind of narrow it down over time to six key partners. Um, there will be other people you try experiment working with, but you'll always find there'll always be a small number who deliver for you. Uh, and I think, um, I think again, I think there's a very misleading uh, idea in business that you often hear people talking about it's a numbers game. 
you know you need to knock on enough doors you need to, to 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 talk to enough people and i think what that ends up doing is having your efforts that your efforts are diluted because you're not being in, you're not you're not being intentional about who you know who are the right people for you hey um are there any stories you'd like to share any sort of favorite examples i mean these could be from your own clients or, or other yeah. joint ventures you've seen um about what story in particular can i think of um I think that, I think that it's not one partner in particular, but I think that over the years, what has really surprised me about partnerships, it is not the biggest partners. It's not the partners with the largest email lists and the partners with the largest audiences that have surprised me. It's mm -hmm. often smaller partners who, um, they'll have a small audience, but they'll have an intimate relationship with the audience who hangs on to every word they say. So if they say that they that they'll promote you and they endorse you, their audience will actually listen and buy from you. And I, I, what I see is when I look at the results of partnerships, um, there'll be partners who deliver good results because, you know, they've got a, if you've got a hundred thousand people in your audience by virtue of your numbers, you will drive a certain number of buyers. But proportionally, I often find smaller partners are are better, mm. and I think that I think this is important because. Um, I think there is a bit of a imposter syndrome that people have when they go into partnerships. They think, well, in fact, I see people squirming when I ask people, like, can you just tell me roughly what's your audience size? They sort of squirm and they, they say, well, I did have 10,000 subscribers, but I cleaned my list up and it's only 5,000 now. And it's like I need to say to them, it's okay, you don't need to make any apologies. Um, mm -hmm. I'm more interested in finding out how engaged your audience is because I'm going to be asking them, you know, uh, you know you've got 5,000 subscribers. I'd be interested to know just roughly what percentage of those people open your emails and what what how many click through uh and and, and it's not about quality it's not about quantity again it's about quality uh and and i and i've frequently been surprised i remember even at miracy um sometimes miracy would do a launch where some of their own students would promote their launch and what those students would do is they'd have one-on-one -on -one conversations with a few of their own clients and say you know you know miracy are running this launch about how to build your course I think you'd find it helpful to go to this live training. Uh, and some of those some of those people who are students that spoke to three, four, five of their own clients ended up generating sales. So that's the point I'm trying to make. It's not about, it's not just about, it's not about quantity, it's about the quality. And, and you will see people who got audiences far, far greater than you who will want to work with you because they love your what you do, they love your offer, and they feel that your audience is engaged. And that to them is far more important than 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 size. So um, yeah, imposter syndrome is is a big problem, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't need to be. Yeah, I, amen, amen. I, you know, it's a story I can think of is we we're doing a fundraiser for this uh, local project in Edmonton. We had called the Local Good, hmm. a kind of a network for folks up to sustainability oriented things, and we did a table captain model. So yeah. we, we invited people, could you fill a table of 10 people? Yeah. And there was one fellow, a friend of mine, uh, Antoine, very well connected uh, in Edmonton, uh, you know, kind of a man about town. And he got two people at his table. Yeah. There was another woman who, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting her name. But she filled, and she was somebody who I just kind of knew from the community. She'd come to my potlucks. Yeah. I'd see her around a lot, but I didn't think much. And she got 20 people. She filled two tables. Yeah. And she wasn't what I would have considered to be the greatest hub. But yeah. she had good relationships and probably maybe more time on her hands than Antoine did. So she yeah. was able to do the personal outreach. And she yeah. actually got the tables filled. So it's, yeah, it's good to be open-minded that sometimes the fact that they're so big also means they're so busy and they just yeah. may not have that bandwidth to give you the kind of support that you would like. Correct. Correct. The, the, correct. Very often it's the, the small people who will, they'll read your messages, they'll reply to your messages. They'll turn up if you're running a briefing for them. Uh, and, 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 and they're, they're easy to work with. And, and I've seen many of those people become rising stars, you know, that they, they, that they, 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 you know, by virtue of, of their commitment, their list, their audience grows, their reach grows, uh, and you start seeing their name coming up again and again. Well, 
let's start to wrap up. I just want to say to everybody, I mean, whether it's, you know, my hub marketing program, whether it's uh, Danny's program, you know, six joint venture partners or the get JV ready. Um, partnerships and relationships are the fundamental way to grow your business. I mean, my colleague, Bradley Morris, he, uh, I think, you know, Bradley, or you're connected yes, with him. Yeah. He, I think it was eight years ago now, he got off social media. He just decided to cancel it all. He didn't like what he saw it doing to him. And the way he's built his business since has been purely in various ways, relationship building, connecting with people, building strong bonds, figuring out where there's a good fit. And that's how he's built everything. If somebody came to me and they said, I need business in the next six months, you know, I need money or, or I'm enough to shut the doors. My candid advice to them would be, I mean, unless they're genius or they know a genius they could hire around it, stop all social media. Just put up a little board saying, I'll be back in six months, I'm taking a break. Take all the time that you've been spending on social media. Plus, you know, of course, once you go on to post something, now you're scrolling and take all that time, shut off social media, take it off your phone and spend that time building relationships with hubs. Spend that time figuring out how can you be getting in front of the audiences of these people who have a, an aligned thing, that this is dramatically faster. I mean, yes, there's the time building the relationship, but it's a tortoise and the hare thing. The social media, right. I think, can feel, because you can post stuff so fast. So you can you can have a lot of activity very quickly with very little effort because you just have to post it and it's done. But the relationship building thing is the is ultimately the approach that works better. And so whoever you, you go with, I just want to underline that approach as, as a better, more effective, faster, and also more sustainable approach. Yeah. Um, but second, if you're looking for help with this, I recommend Danny and his programs. Uh, Danny has worked in this field uh, as a joint venture manager uh, with, yeah, with Danny Innie, with Miracy, and, you know, I, I believe with others too, and, and has been, uh, knows this field has the metrics on it, has the chops, has the years of experience, uh, has a podcast, you know, on this topic. Uh, so, you know, I just don't know anybody else uh, in the world who has this kind of experience around joint venture stuff. So if you're interested in getting help, please check out Danny's webinar. And also I hope you'll consider his boot camp. I love the idea of getting joint venture ready. And I think it's also a model that a lot of my clients could take of, creating the, you know, I could call it a starter kit or creating a program like this to help your clients get ready to actually do the work because often they're not. Uh, and you can create something in your business model to get them ready. So I think it's brilliant and beautiful. So the webinar, August 29th, boot camp, September 9th through 13th. Uh, we'll put the links uh, here in the email below and below the YouTube. And if you have any questions, if people want to reach out to you, how do they reach you? So if you want to reach me directly, just uh, danny at captainjv.co. Really danny nice. at captainjv.co. That's it, yeah. Amazing. And what's the um, URL for, well, we'll put the URLs below um, for all of this. But thanks for tuning in, Danny. Thank you for making the I'm time. Great to be here. And I'll see you down the road.